Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a virtual event with Arvin Amadi in conversation with Tommy Dorfman, who are here to discuss how it all blew up. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn about it um, on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Our next event is Monday, October 5th at 6 p.m. with Andrew Lowe and Valerie Liu discussing Chinatown Pretty, fashion and wisdom from Chinatown's most stylish singers. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter, which you can do on our website. To submit a question during the event, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you would like our speakers to answer, please click the Like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please do not use the sidebar chat as a question, to ask a question. Also, please support our bookstore and our authors by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book. To do that, just click the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. So a little more about Arvin. Arvin is the author of Girl Gone Vi uh, Viral and Down and Across. He grew up outside of Washington, D.C. and graduated from Columbia University, where he studied political science and computer science. He also ha has worked in the tech industry, the tech industry. A little bit more about Tommy. Tommy is an actor known for playing the role of Ryan on the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why. They graduated from Fordham University with a B.A. in arts. They helped design a fashion collection with ASOS and were honored with the Rising Star Award by GLAAD. In spring 2019, Tommy made their uh, New York theatrical debut in the new group's production of Jeremy O'Harris's play Daddy, directed by Don Danya Taymor. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the, the camera over to Arvin and Tommy. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Hey, Tommy. Hi, how's it going? It's going good. Um, can you hear New York outside my window? I can. I feel like I heard a dog, but I didn't know if that was yours. There is a dog. Uh, he's very. Uh, Where is he? He's in the other room sleeping. Um, I took my an extra long walk. Before, so I'm going to shut the window real quick. <laughs> Hi, everybody. There's like a biker gang driving by, and that's like always the loudest, just all the like rev, rev, revving. Um, but no, Hudson's in the other room. It. Past Aww. because we had an extra long walk this morning. That's so sweet. I really loved your book. I found it so moving, and I love Italy. Thank I you. wish that I had skipped my high school graduation and fled to Italy uh, <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> did, was that based on some truth for you as a person? Like, did you have an experience like that, or where did the idea for how it all blew up come from? Well, it's funny, yeah, because the book does open with a story based on true events. Um, and so you mm -hmm. think from the first 20 pages that the setup is the true event. Uh, the setup is actually like the one part of the book that is pretty much made up. Like the fact that this boy is about to graduate high school and then these bullies blackmail him because they saw him hooking up with like the hot football player. None of that mm -hmm. happened to me when I was 18. Same. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for better or worse, specifically the football player part, I wouldn't have minded that. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, so that part was made up, um, but I did run away to Italy when I was 25. Um, and that was kind of like what you're doing right now. It was a writing retreat. Like, I just wanted to go somewhere away from New York, the place that I knew, the friends that I knew, and I wanted to go somewhere and just get away and write for a little bit. So I, you know, sublimated my place in the city. And I found a little attic apartment in Rome and I just went there to write for a couple months. The plan was never to have a big adventure of my own. Like all of the events that happened to Amir for the most part happened to me my summer in Italy. Mm -hmm. Starting with walking into a bookstore and meeting a gorgeous bookseller who then told me to go to a bar where I met this Iranian queer poet bartender just larger than life person. And then that person, Jahan, encouraged me to do tutoring lessons with the bookseller. So those two people basically became my best friends over the summer, much like with Amir, um, and just helped me kind of like come to terms with a lot of parts of my identity that I think I had, 
I had come out. I mean, I'd always been out as an Iranian person, a Muslim person, right? Um, right. Pretty recently, I guess in college, come out um, as gay. But I never really reconciled those two parts together. I think I still felt a deep amount of shame in being Iranian and gay. You know, like mm-hmm. I remember like seeing headlines about gay people getting killed in Iran and just feeling so ashamed to my LGBT community, almost as if it was my fault that that was happening. You know, did writing this book help you come to terms with that intersectionality? It did. And, and I mean, the book solidified it, but it was really that summer spending it with Jahan and his friends. We're like, Jahan, mm-hmm. we're so proud of our Iranian culture. Um, and really like, basically like queered it up for me. Like I, yeah. I remember our very first night together, he was telling me about this like uh, musician, singer, fairy dude in like the sixties, who was like a queer icon. It was so clearly like, queer and flamboyant, but like no one could talk about it because it was 1960s Iran, which admittedly was more liberal. And apparently Fairy Dune had this sister who was like a famous Iranian poet and she was very depressed, like Persian Emily Dickinson. And I just like, this was a part of my culture no one had ever talked to me about, you know? Like when it came to my culture, I obviously, you know, I spoke the language and I knew my parents' stories, um, but for the most part, I was internalizing the headlines and the stereotypes. I wasn't internalizing the sort of queer perspective. Um, and so it became like a way to reframe, like I, I basically like reframed my Persian side, my Iranian heritage and saw it in a different light. And all of a sudden it became that much more compatible with my queer side. Yeah, I relate to that to a certain degree coming from the South and growing up there and having like one very clear, distinct idea of like football and sports and uh, extremely conservative. But then as I came out, I was introduced to you know, queer people in Atlanta and I got to understand like the history of drag in Atlanta and the roots of drag there. And um, it's really beautiful. And I think this book does such a great job in showing how a chosen family can really take care of you as you're coming into adulthood, as you're trying to understand yourself and where you come from and how that changes the relationships you have with your parents or with your siblings. Yeah, and I think everyone has that Jahan figure in their life. Um, whether it's a real person that you meet, or maybe it's a book, or maybe it's an online community. I mean, I'm curious, kind of like in terms of seeing your Southern heritage in a different way. Like, was there a Jahan-like figure or a book or something? I think there. I used to sneak in my room and watch Queer as Folk <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, the American version kid when I was 14, right? Yeah. When I was realizing that I was gay and there was something about that. That's when that I was, was really like, out under my covers. Yeah, <laughs> it made me really excited about being queer. And so I, I kind of I sought out that type of relationship with queer people, which healthy or not um, was sort of my mo- more formative years. And then since then I've obviously expanded um, in a different way. And yeah, I've had many different people like that in my life who helped guide me. Right, so to speak, and help me better understand myself and my culture and where I come from. I think uh, having a good understanding of your history is is really important to figure out who you are as a person today, and also what you want to bring into that space um, when you come from different types of identities. Now, did you feel like writing this book because it was so close to home differed greatly from the first two books you've written? Like, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, so there are two parts in kind of putting a book out. There's the writing and there's the authoring. I think the writing part could not have been easier. I mean, there were still the usual challenges of plot and character development and revision, but the first draft of this story really just flowed out of me. I think I wrote that first draft in three months, which is like way faster than I had written my last two books. Um, And it's because it was just such a personal story and it was the story that I couldn't not write. You know, like after I got back from that summer in Italy, um, and especially because I got back and I found myself kind of like getting closeted all over again in certain parts of my life. Mm. You know, like I felt myself receding um, in ways that I thought I had like come forward. Mm. You know, I felt like I'd made so much progress and then all of a sudden I was kind of becoming that old person again. And so I doubly felt it was important to write this book. Like not only, you know, because I thought it was a great story and not only because like I wanted to write the book that teen me would have loved and that I know teenagers today need, um, but for myself, for that selfish reason that I just wanted to be fully out of the closet and proud of all the messy parts of my identity. Um, and yeah, so, I think, yeah, it was like a race to the finish line in that first draft just because I had so many reasons I wanted to write it. Totally, and I think when thinking about my high school experience and you and I 
I think are close in age. And I didn't have, there were no books for me to really look at, right? There were no teen books that had queer protagonists. Um, I was just watching a commercial from the early 2000s yesterday. I don't know if you saw this on Instagram. It was like making its way around. It was an anti-smoking commercial. Yes. <laughs> Did you see that? And it was like, smoking makes you gay. Uh, <laughs> and, I kept thinking, and I watched it and I was like, God, it's so interesting that that was the kind of media that I was consuming. Yeah. Um, and when I read this, I was like, how powerful this must be for someone who is Muslim and queer and a teenager and isn't out to their family yet, um, but could hide away in a bookstore somewhere and read this yeah. in the pri or have it on a Kindle or have it on an iPad or however you guys read books, if you even read books, um, and have an opportunity to share in this little world and feel less alone. Um, I think it's so important that you're out here creating stories like this and providing that kind of representation and inspiration for kids. Yeah, I mean, when I think about the kind of like books that I loved as a kid, like, of course, there was nothing really with like an Iranian or queer character. And even if there were, right. I wasn't actively seeking out gay books. Um, but I was seeking out books about people who were really different. Um, and that kind mm. of applied across the board in all media. So like one of my favorite books was It's Kind of a Funny Story by Ned Vizzini. Um, and it's like a, you know, beautiful story. And it's based on his own, you know, Ned's sort of like real life struggle with depression and suicide. Um, and I just, I adored that book so much because it was about a weirdo, a misfit, who just had this thing that made him so different um, that he mm. was Similarly, even before then, like I, it's funny, I was like a theater kid in like elementary and middle school, and I played the ugly duckling in two different versions <laughs> of Honk. <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah, and like I really related to that role so much, specifically this one song that he had, his solo, his big solo, um, about being different, you know? And mm. I just like, I, I so see now like why I kind of like, veered towards stories like Ned Vizzini's or like musicals like Honk um, about outsiders. Because I think I felt like an outsider both like in the world as an Iranian Muslim person and then even within my own community as a closeted kid. Of course, yeah, I think I, I read a lot of like Augustine Burroughs when I was younger for a lot of the same reasons and David Sedaris and like mm -hmm. people who wrote about that kind of experience. And I wish I'm I talking about what? I wish I discovered David Sedaris as a kid. <laughs> I love David Sedaris. Um, I think the thing that really broke my heart in the story, and then obviously this speaks true to your experience, and if you want to talk about it, I'd love to hear more just about being discriminated against primarily, like not even having anything to do with your queerness, right? And that's how the book opens, and that's sort of this through line throughout is what it means to be an immigrant family, an Iranian family in America, what it means to travel, what yeah. that feels like. Um, and why it's still important today to talk about and write about. Yeah, I mean, that that opening line, first, let me get one thing straight, I'm not a terrorist, I'm gay. That's honestly based on a story, of, you know, that's, that's based on a real life thing as well. Um, towards the end of my summer in Italy, I was traveling and I got stopped at the airport. Um, mm. And I was at the airport in Rome and I got pulled aside by a customs officer. Um, and she was just asking me a bunch of questions about what I'd been doing in Rome, who I'd been seeing, who I'd been hanging out with. And so I started to get into pretty much like the details of my summer where I was effectively telling her like, okay, you clearly think I'm a threat or there's something suspicious about me, but I'm not. <laughs> Here are all these gay men that I've been hanging out with. Here's the name of the gay bar that I've been going to. Like, did I mention that these right. are gay? And I realized after the fact that I was like so clearly trying to prove to her that I was westernized, as if like by being mm. gay and westernized, I wasn't like those other Muslims. I wasn't fitting your stereotype of what a Muslim person is, especially at the mm. um, And that didn't sit well with me. I hated that I was almost like trying to make myself into this model minority. You know, like I am, I am a fully like liberal, westernized, contemporary Muslim. You don't have to worry about me blowing up any airplanes. Um, right. And I just felt like I'm in that situation, especially because the argument that he and his family have in the plane that people get suspicious about them over um, was about his coming out. Like I just that that opening line was the first part of the story that came to me. And I just felt like it like represented his clash so much, like that internal clash of his. And then also just like 
you know, the way that he's being discriminated and the way that he thinks he can get out of that discrimination. Uh, but I mean, even within the interrogation rooms, like there's Amir and his mom and dad and sister, and they are all treated differently. I mean, Amir yeah. and his sister are a little bit more lighthearted and casual in how they speak to this officer, whereas the mom and dad are much more stiff and more serious. Um, and they have to be, you know, because they have accents, you know, they're immigrants. Like the dad has a record with, you know, with yep. traveling. Um, and the mom, I mean, they like pull up a photo of her on her phone of her in a hijab and are, you know, super suspicious of that. And so there are just all of these things that like, even within this Muslim family, they are not treated the same, you know, like some of them. Even down to like giving the sister ice cream instead of. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I wanted to touch on the relative privilege um, that goes on in there as well, because I think so often, like as second generation kids, as kids who are like born and raised in America, um, we don't want to see ourselves as different. We want to see ourselves as American. We want to see ourselves as like, like our white counterparts, um, when that's just not the case. And especially with family members of ours who are being discriminated, like you see with Soraya, she gets it eventually and that hurts. She doesn't like that she's getting ice cream and her mom is getting weird stares. Do, when, how was coming out for you to your family? Did it take a while to, was there an educational curve that kind of had to be met? Was there, for sure. did it take time to sort of come back together? Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's why I wrote the book the way that I did. Um, like, you'll notice that I don't actually show that phone call where there's a phone call that's alluded to where like Amir and his parents finally talk about his coming out. Um, and you don't see that. I think all you get is Amir saying to the airport officer, I don't want to talk about that phone call. And I glossed over it because I didn't want to show that family in that sort of like most vulnerable, messy moment, because like that is the mm. stereotype already, you know, like the stereotype around religious families, Muslim families, Christian families is that they are going to say nasty things to their gay son or reject them. When in reality, right. like it is so much more complicated because especially with immigrants, immigrant families, a lot of times they just don't have the vocabulary around these subjects, you know, like they, they're being caught off guard and might say something that they don't really mean or that they will regret. Um, and so I wanted to show the process in which they wish that maybe they maybe said something differently and that they eventually come around to understanding and start to see that like their son is still their son and that there is a world in which they can love him um, without showing the nastiest parts. Basically, I just didn't want to get into the tragedy point of it all. Because yeah. Like, so many other forms of media are already kind of like, cranking up the volume on the tragedy porn. Instead, I wanted to kind of like examine the after. And I wanted yeah. to show how this family is thinking about it and how they are coming to terms with like, with with this thing. No, I appreciate that. I think it's really important as well to have queer stories with happier endings overall. Um, where did the, did the blackmailing part of the book, did that feel like something that was that relative to an experience that you had had, or was that more just a device for the book? That was interestingly, so the um, the reason that I was traveling towards the end of that summer in Italy, I was going to visit a friend in Berlin. Um, mm -hmm. who, this friend I had met like six months prior, and I had met him right before like the premiere of Love, Simon. And it was at a birthday party, and I just overheard someone behind me talking about how they had like been blackmailed by their roommates for being gay in their like first relationship in the city. And I turned around and I was like, oh my God, that's the story of Love, Simon, you know? And he was like, what's that? I've never heard of it. So I told him like, you have to go watch Love, Simon. Like this story that you're describing that happened to you, it is Love, Simon. And he did right. and me after it being like, oh my God, that was beautiful. I cried, all these things. Mm -hmm. um, and this person also happened to be half Lebanese. Um, so mm -hmm. I kind of, I, we became friends and I related to him just on that like gay Middle Eastern level. Um, and so that's where it's funny because when I was flying to Berlin, I actually had this idea where I wanted to ask him if I could kind of write that story of his as like, or like use it in like an adult novel of mine. Mm. Um, because it was, it was just happening around the time that he was like falling in love for the first time after college and he was 22 and his boyfriend was 22. Um, but then it's, you know, basically my summer in Italy happened and that airport incident happened and he and I were like hanging out in a park in Berlin um, and definitely not getting high in a park in Berlin because who does that? <laughs> <laughs> and I basically told him like the entire story 
of my summer and of the airport, he just like looks at me and he's like, wow. dude, this is the book you need to write. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a combination of like all those things that had just happened, like the coming of age summer that I had had with Jahan and Neil, the incident at the airport where I was trying to prove myself as like, you know, not like those other Muslims are gay. And then mm. this person, this like other Middle Eastern gay person um, with that really interesting kind of like blackmail story um, that they had like overcome. And uh, yeah, like all of those things came together into how it all blew up. That's beautiful. Um, I think my last question is sort of, I guess, and I get asked this a lot and I'm, I'm curious about other people's yeah. answers. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's struggling to own certain facets of their identity, like Amir is struggling? Who's struggling to own their identity? Yeah, who's struggling to sort of like come to terms with their identity and find confidence in themselves. Yeah. Um, go at your own pace. You know, like one thing that I'm so thankful for is that no one ever pressured me to come out to my parents faster or to the world faster. I mean, there was a long time where I would, I, I was in a year long relationship where I never posted a single photo of the relationship, you know, because I just didn't want the world to see. Um, and, you know, I didn't want my family to see and things like that. And it breaks my heart, but at the same time, I'm glad that I, like no one was pressuring me, my friends or my boyfriend or anything like that to kind of go at it any faster than I felt comfortable. So that's, yeah. you know, I'd say go at your own pace. Um, of course, like you'll find your people. And when you do, I think it'll feel right that moment where you decide, fuck it, I don't want to hide any part of them <laughs> anymore. Like there is that fuck it moment that like you cannot, you can't plan for, you can't like mark mm -hmm. it on your calendar. It'll just happen. And until then, like don't let anyone pressure you, just go at your own pace. I love that. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, sweet. Should we do some yeah. audience questions? We have some questions down here. Do you want to pick or do you want me to pick for you? Uh, you pick. OK. Um, do you think you'll ever write a sequel to Amir's story? Ooh. I Actually, yes. I do have a sequel. It's not planned. I'm not actively writing it, but I would love to write it one day. Um, I have a title and a setup. It's called As Loud As Possible. So, mm. you know, just Amir finally, like, it's it's just, you know, he's on another just level. Just doing that thing that everyone does when they come out and they just become, like, the absolute gayest version they of themselves. Maybe the gayest version of themselves, yeah. They <laughs> <laughs> the amount of different types of queer people I've been in the, well, like, 15 years that I've been out of the closet is remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I guess like in the same vein of, of gayness and queerness, um, it would be it would be at a wedding, his tutor's wedding, um, except that something has gone terribly wrong at the wedding, and now Amir, his tutor, the fiance, and Jahan are all in an Italian police station getting questioned. And so same setup, same framing device, right? But with you know Italian police officers who speak very little English across the table. And they're, you know, the events of the wedding are unfolding in that same format. So. Right, a mystery. Yeah, yeah. So um, I go write it one day. You, know, you should. Yeah. How old were you when you started writing your first book? I was twenty-one. I was a senior in college, and yeah, I just I was finishing up my computer science degree at Columbia, and I was just feeling really. I'm certain about like the direction of my life. I had no clue what I was passionate about, what I was going to do for the next 40 or 50 years of my life. Cause that's, I mean, like mm. that graduate college, right? All of a sudden you're off of this structured path and now it's just the rest of forever ahead of you. And so all of that anxiety kind of made its way into a Microsoft Word document. And that's how that process happened. I love it. What is your process when you're writing? Are you a plotter or a, Answer. Answer. I'm both. I like to. Mm, I'm. I'm a plotter with a pantser moon. I guess. Uh -huh. Answer with a plotter moon. I don't really like know astrology. You're like a type A bitch, who will let the characters flow sometimes. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and actually it's the other way around. Sorry, I'm a pantser with a plotter moon. So I'm a messy bitch who occasionally gets his shit together and gets organized. <laughs> yeah, that that is that is it. I relate to that deeply. On Are you level. I'm always overwriting and then having to figure it out after. Right. And like I, I pl I'll plant so many seeds that I don't see to fruition and then have to decide whether or not I want to see them to fruition. Or I'll like see something to the end, but I'd never like built it up at the beginning. So then right. I'm going, it's a lot of this, which I enjoy that. I kind of enjoy yeah, the chaos. The puzzle, the puzzle things part. together. Exactly. Yeah. I was just thinking um, the other day that like writing sometimes feels like you're, and this is a little bit based on a metaphor a friend used, but like you're floating out at sea and you're like, there is like, you're collecting all of these pieces. Mm. And then, like you have to like clean it up a little bit, wipe off the dirt, polish it, look at it, and then once you have all these like seemingly disparate pieces, you're putting them together into like I'm no boat. Totally. Um, let's see what what is your advice for someone who's LGBTQ plus and lives in Iran? And lives oh yeah, um, I feel for them so much. Um, but I, I'm so happy that they have the internet at their disposal. I remember when this book was announced, um, within hours, I got a DM, like a long DM from someone in Iran saying, look, I am, you know, a queer person in Iran. I'm not out. I don't know if I will ever get to be out and be myself, but I'm so excited for your book. And I'm so excited that at least within these hundreds of pages, at least for a couple of hours, I'll be able to like be myself. Mm. And that just, I mean, like... He hadn't even read a page of the book yet. I mean, they like, like they didn't even really know what it was about, other than gay and Iranian. They were just so thankful for the story to exist and to be able to live in this story for a little bit. And That's so, true. I mean, yeah, find your people, find your stories, and just find a way to be yourself wherever and however you can. What is your favorite part of the book? Um, or do you have a favorite line? I do, I do, and it's actually, it is, it's related to that um, because I think one of the things is we always talk about own your identity, don't let anyone tell you like how to be or, you know, all those things. But Amir talks about safety, you know, because I think for a lot of mm -hmm. people, safety is like a real concern, especially when you're living in a country like Iran or just living in a house yeah. that is maybe more conservative and your parents still, you know, you're still their dependent. And so, you know, there's a, there's a line there about uh, when your safety hinges on a stereotype being true or not, you don't get to be brave. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. I right? love that line. Yeah, because as much as you want to think beyond the stereotypes and not buy into the stereotypes, like sometimes you're not able to take that risk and be hopeful, mm -hmm. especially as a queer teen, you know, who is still like under your parents' roof. And so, yeah. you know, be yourself, be brave, be all those things wherever you can. Um, maybe that's on Twitter. Maybe that's on Tumblr. Maybe that's through TV shows and fan fiction. That's Tumblr. Um, you don't have to be brave and be fully out in the real world until you feel fully safe. Um, and I yeah. think that's important. I wanted to establish that in like the first 10 pages of the book. It's so beautiful. I really love to, I, this line, um, the thing about bigots is they always go out of their way to acknowledge my fabulous existence when I hardly notice theirs. Yeah. Uh, which is not always true, but I think like when you've reached that level of confidence in yourself and you've done enough work on yourself and you trust that like the person you are is not evil and the person you are can be beautiful and should be accepted. Yeah. Um, which I feel like is only a place that I got to like in my mid to late twenties. And so I'm just there now. Yeah. And I, that really stuck with me throughout the whole book. There's a really funny person on TikTok who lives in Europe who makes videos like walking down the street looking absolutely incredible and saying shit like that. Yeah, no. I, like, that why was, are you staring at me? <laughs> and that that was so the essence of Jahan and like the thing about him that I like to this day just like like am in awe of. And you know that like no one is fully, no one is like impenetrable. You know, like no, 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 no amount of confidence will like protect you from every form of every bit of bigotry. Um, but I think you still have to own that confidence. Um, and knowing that you can, seeing someone else do it, just goes such a long way in like helping a queer kid or helping a young person kind of get there 
themselves. And I think on that note, what gave you the courage to come out of the closet? This is also a question that lined up really well. From I mean, I think it's I think it's the same. Honestly, I think it's probably I mean the same reasons that like you feel so like you feel it's so necessary to be yourself on social mm. media and your activism and your art. Um, because if you're not owning it, then you're giving to the shame to the extent that everything in the world is power and shame. Um, the more that you're hiding something, the more that you are giving in to that shame that the stereotypes in the world are trying to inflict upon you. And it's the only way to kind of swing the pendulum the other way is to own it. I mean, that's what, how it all blew up was supposed to be for me. I think my future books and projects and art will be very degrees of queerness. I mean, not everything will be a coming out story or even a queer story, but I wanted this one to be loud and proud about yeah. who Amir is and by association who I am, you know? Um, because I think that way I can just make art and walk through this world that much more confidently. Totally, I mean, congratulations, you, you did it. You did the thing. Are you, do you have plans to go back to Italy and see these friends? Yes, yeah, I mean, much like in the book, uh, uh, I, uh, Neil, the tutor is supposed to get married. So that wedding is still pending. Um, and I am, you know, once I think the world opens back up, it'll happen and we'll all be reunited back in Italy. Um, so fun. So I can't wait to go back. I love Italy. It's my favorite, favorite, yeah. favorite place. Um, do you want to read some of your book? Yeah, actually I will read since, you know, you like that line so much. I'll read the, um, the section, because I just have it right here uh, with Jahan. Okay. Ah. So this is when they're all at that first party. It's the first party that Amir, you know, just to set it up. Um, it's the first party that Amir goes to with Jahan and Neil. Um, and where he meets their group of queer friends. Um, and he's like a little bit in awe of everyone. I mean, not just like staying out late um, and being in Italy part, but also these like, you know, like, out in the crowd for me. So, mm. Giovanni jumped up on a creaky old armchair and announced that we were moving to a bar in Testaccio, another neighborhood in Rome. It was nearly three in the morning. I couldn't believe these people still had the energy to go out. But Giovanni rallied the troops and we left the apartment, wandering the streets of Rome to our next destination. It was a long walk. We crossed the bridge over to Trastevere, and our group was so loud and so obnoxious that half the people we passed avoided us like the plague while the other half high-fived us and took part in our debauchery. The streets of Trastevere were cramped and alive as ever. We marched right past every bar, every temptation. Eventually, we reached a second bridge to Testaccio. On this bridge, a group of Italian boys, they looked like teenagers, maybe even younger than me, noticed us and yelled some cruel world words at Jahan in drunken Italian before exploding into cruel laughter. I didn't need to understand what they were saying to know what had just happened. I was shocked, but Jahan just smiled. He waved the pearls he had put on at Giovanni's, and when he caught the look of shock on my face, he said, the thing about bigots is they always go out of their way to acknowledge my fabulous existence when I hardly notice theirs. You see, Jahan always had the power. Me, I'd felt powerless my whole life. This was new to me, confidence, power, whatever you want to call it. But instead of feeling inspired by Jahan's words, by knowing I could be like that someday too, I felt an itch under my shirt. Jahan's blackmail came rushing back. You wouldn't want us to smear your faggy little secret across town, would you? I was quiet the rest of the way through, or Jake's blackmail came rushing back. I was quiet the rest of the way through Testaccio as the anxiety festered under my skin. I felt it through my shirt like a burning rash, and I thought that if the other boys could so much as look at me, they would see it. Could Jahan tell that I was hiding this big secret, that I was stalling a big decision? Could he tell that I wasn't totally comfortable, that I was spiraling inside my head, that I was neither here nor there? Maybe all they could tell was that I had four glasses of red wine. I was drunk. Being drunk can be a great and a terrible thing. It can help cover up your emotions or it can expose the hell out of them. It can help you make friends and lose them. So. Thank you. That's so beautiful. Yeah. And I do appreciate that Amir ends on that, like, maybe I'm just drunk note, um, because that was kind of the cadence that I went for with the whole book, which was like, I didn't want it to be all serious, all black, yeah. all coming out. I needed there to be those moments of like, 
levity and just, you know, living amidst all the shit. Yeah, I think that's so important and and really speaks to the experience. I think everyone can relate to this experience of being away from home for the first time, just on a very general basic level and having the opportunity to kind of be whatever person you want to be. Yeah. And that's something I look I look back on that those years of my life so fondly. Yeah. When things weren't so defined for me yet, when I was meeting a lot of new people and they didn't have, you know, an idea of who I was already in their head before meeting them. Um, that's kind of been stripped away from me entirely now, but, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, like there, those years were like so formative and so beautiful and it was really nice to watch a young person and I mean, watch my imagination, um, a young person in, the, in your book go through that and, kind of find that confidence and find their sense of humor. And cause it's clear, you know, it's like yeah. going from being the really quiet kid at school who doesn't talk to anybody who like has no friends to opening up and drinking for the first time and having all these very lively experiences and being shown, not just told that you can live in whatever way you want to live without yeah. shame. And I mean, that's, that is what informs Amir's freak out on the airplane. It's because he feels like he's become this person, this ideal version of himself in Italy. And then all of a sudden around his family, it's back to business as usual. You know, Jackson, this boy that he, or not Jackson, sorry, Valeria, the Italian boy that he like kisses in the Sistine Chapel. They run into him on their last name, Italy, right before their I family. love that scene. And he, I also wanted more with them. I feel like the sequel actually, here's, oh. here's where your sequel needs to be. Okay. Is just them. <laughs> it's uh, more more Amir and Valerio, maybe even a little love triangle with Jackson, a little like Jackson return. But I mean, like Amir hates himself for calling Valerio his friend. His parents are like, who is that? And he's like, oh, it's his friend. And I think a lot of us have been there, you know, where where we think we're out, we think we're doing well, we think we're so confident, but then we retreat mm -hmm. into these seemingly cowardly, we feel like cowards, you know, for not only Yeah, it felt very, I related to that, that feeling that you have when you go to like for me it was i went to college in new york city mm -hmm. and then i came back to georgia for the first time over christmas break and i felt like i was receding back into the person that i was yeah before and i was like and i felt like nobody could understand me at home because they didn't understand the experiences that i had had yeah while i was away living in the city and i think that feeling is inevitable i mean i hate like you know maybe years from now i'll be in a taxi cab with my husband and I refrain maybe from holding his hand because I'm like, well, who knows, you know? And I just like, you know, it's hard to be yourself, all of yourself in every single situation at every single moment in your life. Um, and I don't like that, but I also get it, you know? And so I think that's what Amir struggles with too. Um, yeah. I feel a little bit like a coward. But yeah, I think I I think it's it's that's what like getting out of your comfort zone and traveling and going somewhere new does. Um, like I think about like like just being able to kind of like at least discover or find out about those parts of yourself that maybe you never wanted to look at. Like I think about kids who like go away to summer camp and then come back like goth or playing the guitar. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, totally. Like don't understand like what happened, you know. Um, so I, I think like on that level, on that level, uh, what happens to Amir can happen to anyone. I remember really early on, I was talking to a reporter about this book, um, and she told me that it reminded her of her own daughter who had gone away to college and had gotten really involved in like Palestinian rights. Um, but she was, this was right before Thanksgiving and she was feeling really nervous about her daughter you know, at the Thanksgiving table because their family was Jewish and her grandparents especially were like very pro-Israel and she knew that her daughter was gonna, so it was like she struggled with like the inevitable conflict that was gonna happen at the table, but was also so proud of her daughter for like being this like 19 year old who was just so like, like believed in what she believed in. Yeah, and like and did the work to educate herself. And, and did the work to educate herself and was going to educate her grandparents even if it was gonna make her getting off. I've been thinking about that a lot. What does it mean to sacrifice family comfort for truth? Or what does it mean to sacrifice other people's comfort yeah. to feel seen or be seen or to get your point across or for the basic need to try and educate people on human rights and equality? And 
I think we're all kind of dealing with that right now and holding yeah. people accountable for the first time ever in our lives. Um, and I think so a lot often of, we don't give people enough credit. I mean, even just thinking of what I said earlier about like, you know, maybe in the future I won't hold my husband's hand in a taxi cab. What if that taxi mm -hmm. cab driver has like a gay daughter himself, you know? Right. Like, what if they're actually like very understanding? And I just kind of like assumed in that situation that like maybe we should just not, you know? Yeah, I think about this and like the op the things that I've missed in my life because I've made the assumption that people are bigots or homophobic or transphobic like people that I that I would not be accepted in a space. Um, and I've been proven wrong a few times, but I've also had the experience of thinking I was going to be really accepted somewhere and it not being the case. And so it's always this question as like, a, for me, like a gender non-conforming queer person, is it worth the like internal dialogue and like dealing, combating my own fear and discomfort to wear what I want to wear because it makes me feel safer and more comfortable in a certain way. But like, is it going to draw, you know, I, it's like always this game of, how far do I want to go? Like, right. do right. I want to break these boundaries? Do I not? And sort of like you were talking about, like when you were being interrogated, it's like, no, like you feel this need to prove yourself as something, right? And it's like, I've noticed in experiences in my life where my voice will drop an octave. Yeah. And I'll like grab, like <laughs> get real Southern. <laughs> like when I'm in Georgia, right? Where it's like, I kind of like turn on this weird character that's not me at all, but it feels safe. Right. I mean, um, that, that is code switching, right? And like, as yeah. many black folk have made us aware, sometimes it's just a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you just have no choice. Yeah, totally. And sure, maybe you're wrong. Maybe that person would have been more than accepting of your true self. But, you know, it's it's that line that I mentioned. When your safety hinges on a stereotype being true, you don't get to be brave. Mm -hmm. You have to play it totally. safe. Does anybody have any more questions? Let me give it a couple minutes if anyone wants to type in another question. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, oh yeah, I'm looking at the questions. I think I feel like I hit them. I feel like we hit them, but I yeah, might, yeah. I might have missed. Uh, the only one I didn't hit was why is the sky blue? And if you have an answer for that, <laughs> please. It is pretty damn blue today, which means I have to like go outside. Right? Yeah, you have to be outside. It's beautiful here as well. I have yeah. to say. No. Um, well, I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for asking me to do this. I feel really honored that I got to share this space with you today. Thank you, Tommy. This has been really, really awesome. I just, I'm so thankful that you made the time for this. Yeah, and I can't wait for book two. Yeah. And three and four. More on the way. <laughs> Thank you both. And that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you again to our guests and to all everyone who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Purchase a copy of How It All Blew Up by clicking the green button on the bottom of your screen. We're also accepting donations on our website. If you'd like a regular update on upcoming events, please make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.